Good evening, and welcome to the Sheen Center, live from New York City. This is the New York Encounter 2021, and I am Rebecca Cherico. I will be moderating this final event of the New York Encounter. Hope always surprises me. Looking back at 2020, with all of its hardships, injustices, confusion, divisions, is it really possible to keep on hoping? And yet, in the midst of so much suffering and confusion, there is something within us that keeps looking forward, that keeps looking up. Deep within, there is a promise that we cannot eliminate. Tonight, we will be hearing stories full of that promise. We are honored to have a number of guests with us this evening, some of them virtual and some of them live on stage with us. The first person we will hear from is Carolina Brito. Carolina Brito is proud of her Latin American roots and she has spent her career working to build communities and classrooms of black and Latino excellence. She started by founding a bilingual ethnic studies program at Cristo Rey Boston and has most recently become the principal at the Rafael Hernandez Dual Language K-8 School, a public school in Boston. The school was founded in 1973 by a group of Puerto Rican families who wanted an education worthy of their children. On March 17th of 2020, the school was closed as a result of the general lockdown imposed to slow the growth of, and spread of COVID-19. They just recently reopened in February. Throughout the pandemic, the Rafael Hernandez School has continued to be a beating heart in Roxbury, the densely populated African-American and Hispanic neighborhood of Boston. We are very grateful to have Carolina with us to share her community's story. It's all you. All right. <laughs> Looks like that's my cue to go. Cool. <laughs> So as uh, Rebecca has marvelously introduced, my name is Carolina, and I am in fact the proud principal of the Hernandez Dual Language K-8 School in the heart of Boston in Roxbury. Um, a little bit about my community, we are 85% Latino, and before the pandemic, about 75% of my families were hitting below the federal poverty line. We don't have data post-pandemic, but I know and I can feel in my gut that that percent has gotten a lot higher. Um, I'm really humbled to be telling the story of my community today because it's actually the story, not of me, but of 851 Black, Latino, and white folks in Boston who are trying to survive, find meaning, and solidarity in a historically catastrophic situation. And this was the year where in schools we all faced racial reckoning, COVID, and then tried to reinvent education while we were at it. Um, so I wanted to name, and it's really important for me to name that this is the story of all of us, because first off, 450 of the protagonists of our tale here are my incredibly resilient students who log on every day. They survived hunger, trauma, loneliness, but they're still out there creating, innovating, and doing incredible academic work. So they deserve that shout out, first and foremost. And then 250 of the folks in this are teachers, staff, families who did the impossible to make it work. And last but certainly not least, this is for me like the real marvel of the year is that through this year, we've met over 150 people from all walks of life across the state who volunteered, donated and met our school community throughout this past year in ways that they'd never interacted with before. And some of these people I may never actually get to meet and others have actually become very dear friends. And so I think this is a little bit of the story of the world opening in a time where all the doors closed for us. Um, and so I'm just gonna tell you very, like, I think, I, I think of this in like three parts. We started redefining ourselves as a community when we were trying to meet the need for food, books, and school supplies. These three little things have actually fundamentally changed who we are and what we've come to value. And um, so I'll just jump in and tell you a little bit about what happened. Our story started with food. So March 17th, we get the notice from the superintendent 
listen, y'all, schools are closing down. I'll see you guys in a month, which all of us knew was like unlikely to happen. But nonetheless, March 17th, we had 24 hours to prep for the building shutting down. So in the 24 hours of prep time, the first thing we panicked about was how kids were actually going to eat over the next month. For many, many families, school lunch and breakfast are a huge part of the strategy to keep folks alive. So that was the first question we asked. How are we gonna stay engaged with learning in that month? And at the time I should mention, like I'm in a high needs district, right? So in my building, I had 48 working computers for 450 children. So it's not like doors closed, everybody gets a free laptop. We only had 48 machines. So the first thought became, how do you stay connected with learning? And so all of us, like dozens of staff members, went into the basement three hours before the building opened for the last day and just stuffed food, like bags with like every book we could find in a closet. And I think part of that experience was just thinking about how do you answer a need with no infrastructure, with no system, with like very little notice to figure out what you're going to do for the people that you love and that you don't get to see for that long. One of these dozens of staff members actually had this brilliant idea to call up the restaurants who were all about to close because of the governor's orders. And we had 15 restaurants donate like a few hundred pounds of fresh produce. So March 17th, end of the school day, it's 3 p.m. And we're giving out bags of like the few Chromebooks we have, a bunch of fresh produce from these restaurants, and like the entire inventory of books from the basement of the school library. I think it just sets the scene because in two hours, like from closing to about 5 p.m., all the food was gone and the books were gone. And we delivered the few packets of work that we could figure out for the next month. And we suddenly realized this is like a drop in the bucket. This is like a 24 hour marathon to meet a need that lasts about like maybe a week in people's lives. So the strategy actually, the question started to change. So my community and particularly like my leadership team had to figure out, I don't know how long this is gonna last. And we need, we tried to like do the cost estimates within the next few weeks of like, how much would it cost to feed all of the folks in my community? To which, by the way, like if you do the math on this one, you're looking roughly at about 700 people, including families and children. Too astronomically expensive. And so we started actually calling everybody we could find in the neighborhood. So every neighborhood partner, organization, nonprofit. I asked my friend who is an engineer by trade, listen, man, I got this problem. How am I going to figure this out? And in the end, within a couple of weeks, we had about 13 partnerships across the city trying to figure out how am I going to feed 700 people with no plan other than I have a need, I've got a handful of volunteers, let's make it happen. And the beauty of the moment actually is in just trying to figure out all of this and knocking on doors and banging down doors sometimes to ask for help, this like incredible thing emerged where because I wasn't afraid to like unashamedly ask and neither was anybody on my team to advocate for families, the world opened up in this really counterintuitive way where now I feel much more connected to like the city and its people because we have a common need. Um, and so within that, like this takes you to about the middle to the end of the spring. We had a whole thing going and uh, at one point, even one of our friends, like these like little miraculous moments kept happening where like one friend who was friends with the other friend has a connection to like Goya. And they gave us a couple thousand pounds of food and through some of the donations that were coming in through the city, we managed to actually employ a group of our families that we knew were going through the toughest time because they had lost employment in the shutdown to come and help us unpack, distribute and like give out those 2000 pounds of food that also went in like three hours, all gone. Um, and these moments are like very, I don't, I intend to share these as moments of like the miraculous, the unexpected and like 
the collection of people who never in any other circumstance would have met each other coming together for a thing. And I have to say, it's not that the meeting the needs of the food is actually solving a problem. I actually think that what we, in retrospect, what I understand that we managed to accomplish was to give people an experience of solidarity and unity in a moment where there is none. And we're talking about like white folks donating and talking to and working for folks of color in my community, folks of color in my community leading initiatives and sort of saying, okay, we have to fix this problem among us, how are we gonna do it? So what I saw was actually like the birth and the birth of a people together trying to solve a problem. And that to me is actually a lot more powerful than we fed some folks. And that's good too. Like you gotta do that. People are starving, you go feed them. But the thing that gets born and that like lives and stays, that's the thing that I've been kind of obsessed and really interested in. Like, how do you get people to work? How do we get people to work together? And I have to say the 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 pinnacle moment for me on this was actually in the fall. <laughs> we, after we gave away all the books, did the food thing. We suddenly realized schools are going to be closed for a really long time. And so not only do we have to feed, we had to keep the system going of like feeding about 600 people a week. We were also trying to figure out how do you pull enough money to like buy some basic school supplies? Cause we got to go do school online. Right. So we're talking notebooks, pencils, pens, what have you. And at one point y'all have read like all of the stuff about teachers unions and remote learning and like all the fights and Boston's no different. I got some great hardworking folks, but they physically weren't reporting to the buildings. So I like ran out of volunteers to pack supplies for like 450 kids. I call my friend Monica, who's like usually unafraid of pretty much anything. <laughs> I call her and I'm like, listen, Monica, I'm, I'm desperate. I have a five person team and I've got to like distribute literally thousands of pounds of like whiteboards, markers, whatever. I don't know who to ask and I'm desperate. And she calls up. And like, I just need you to like picture this visual. She calls up her caravan of like white suburban mom friends. And I want you to picture them like all driving into Roxbury in their soccer mom vans and like lining my parking lot. And before I know it, I have 25 little kids who are all like under the age of 10 there to volunteer for a Saturday with their 12 to 13 parents, most of whom I constantly get into like fights because this is in the middle of election season, mind you. So like, these are people that I usually get into fights about like, are you kidding that you just voted for Trump conversations who are all showing up to my door to be like, oh, you called, you needed us. <laughs> and I, I have to say that that was like one of the most important things that have happened to me all year because it caught me by surprise. These are not, this is not like the, the, the ideological crew that you'd usually roll with when asking for help for people of color, right? Like that's not by intuition, not who I'm gonna call first. But it was a beautiful moment for me because this was right, this was probably October. So right when things got real heated around the conversation around elections and watching people come together and show up at the door because there was a need not because there was an ideological call, because there was a need. I was profoundly moved by that. And I think that moment for me, like redefined my understanding of what it means to build community in crisis. So it is to look a need in the face and to say, we might have some stuff that actually divides us fundamentally here, but at the end of the day, if we are to call ourselves church or Christians, then you move because your brother or your sister needs you. And you leave the rest at the door. And I was much more interested, I was much more interested in what it meant to marry my faith to my work because of that experience than I was before. I think for me before, like privately, I do things for, you know, in connection to my faith but to actually walk with people and say, we're gonna do this together. 
I think that was a moment for me of actually breaking a lot of my own ideological barriers and actually building and believing um, in the solidarity of people. And so I think that for me was a very redeeming moment. And we've had many of those since and probably run out of time right now. But I just wanted to share that with you guys and close with a little bit of an Amanda Gorman quote, which seems to be the thing to do nowadays because Amanda Gorman is amazing. But I think I would actually sum up the year as follows. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be. So thank you for letting me share my story. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about you guys too on this panel. Thank you, Carolina. It's, it's really beautiful to hear about the unity um, of a people that really emerged from this, this moment of crisis. Um, now we're going to hear from Matthew Laracy. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Matt Laracy and his wife, Mary Lynn, have been married for 50 years and brought up their seven children in Jersey City. Matt worked as a supervisor for UPS, as a parish catechist, and also as a high school religion teacher while raising his family. Together with a group of family and friends, he founded a nonprofit in Jersey City 12 years ago. It is called Magnificat Home and offers a home to low-income women in what were once convents. Since its beginning, Matt has been dedicated to directing Magnificat Home and making it a place of welcome. You might think that a pandemic might have shaken him up or disrupted life at Magnificat Home, but you'd be wrong. What Matt has to share with us tonight is a witness of hope and of peace. Let's hear from him how and why. Years ago, I made a great discovery that was to change my life. I discovered the boarding home people. My brother-in-law, Mark, invited me to a boarding home where he was working in Newark. And I got to know these people, and they welcomed me like I was their favorite cousin or their long-lost brother. Uh, I would show up there to visit them with a couple of brownies, and they made me feel like I was a king. When I would leave there on a Monday night, and I felt like I was the most important person in the world. So the boarding home people are, for me, like the, uh, the forgotten people, the invisible people. They fall through the cracks. They're not quite homeless. They're, 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 they're not in institutions, they're not in hospitals or, or group homes or prisons, but they lack the resources to provide a, a, a decent home for themselves. They might get $800 a week uh, of a social security check. So these people, um, I find them to be endearing, humble, full of faith, uh, often wounded, sometimes crazy, but in entertaining ways and entirely captivating. So let's see a short video of, uh, of some of our residents. Magnificat is a home for women. It's a nonprofit. What we're trying to do here in this what used to be a convent is to make a nice home where, where women can come and feel happy and safe and, and make it pretty and have good food and just a relaxing, peaceful place. Magnificat Home is a very special home. I didn't have a place to stay and they welcomed me here at Magnificat Home. And it does provide the three meals a day. Uh, I have my own room and um, people are very nice and friendly and everyone gets along with each other and um, I've enjoyed my stay here. It has a warmth here that you don't find in a shelter. It has love in this house. When I didn't have a place to go, Matt came to me personally and he helped me out. He helped me um, to get a room, a place to live. Um, I really appreciate it. We are well taken care of. We're safe and secure. We each have our own rooms. And I'd like to take the time to tell the people out there to please keep us going. It's just like home. It's just like home. So maybe you can understand. I fell in love with these people. I wanted to do something. I was talking with my sisters and my friends, and oh, pretty much everybody knows someone who needs a good boarding home, you know? 
and I made some feeble efforts, but nothing uh, was working out. And I remember making a very clear, uh, simple proposal to God that I wanted to do something, but it's, it's a big job, it needs resources. I said, Lord, you would need to gather a team, like a strong team. And I want to be on that team and play my role, but you need to gather a team. So fast forward about five years, and I'm walking across northern Spain. I'm doing the Camino de Santiago, and I'm enjoying, I mean, the fresh air and the walk and the countryside and the history, and I'm walking alone, so I'm enjoying solitude and prayer. And um, a prayer that would well up in me is I would pray, Lord, do you have a purpose for me? And as soon as I would say that, I would think of the boarding home people. And as soon as I thought of them, I would say, we've already discussed this. You need to bring a team together. So that prayer was like recurring as I'm walking across Spain. And at some point, I, I, my mind sort of stopped and I thought, and all of a sudden, in my mind's eye, I could see in my own network of family and friends, I'm one of nine, I have seven children. We have a whole network of friends and in-laws. So I realized we actually had the resources. We had the money, we had the energy, the interest. So we had a meeting and there was a lot of enthusiasm. And my mother, my mother just passed away a month ago at 101. She had a beautiful life, a very peaceful and calm death. So she said, well, how much would this thing cost? And I said, I think about $100,000 to jumpstart. And she said, I'll give you a $50,000 check when you're ready. So we were off and running. Now, um, Magnifica Home for me has been a series almost daily of surprises and delights. And it's low stress work. It's not no stress, but it's low stress for me I think because I have a very serene conviction that this work came from God, like it dropped down from heaven on the Camino, you know? And other words, he's in charge. I'm not carrying this work. All I have to do is my little role. Um, and divine providence is taking care of things. It's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like the field of dreams where they say, you know, if you build it, they will come. Or it's like, um, it's like, it's like AA, you know, AA does not, uh, we, we don't market, we don't recruit. AA, the, the motto is, I think, attraction, not promotion. It's like, I used to love Michael Jordan after a game when he scored like 45 points and he won with a triple-double and, and, and double overtime. Um, and he would say, I let the game come to me. So I want to be like Mike. So I kind of let the game come to me because I know the Lord is watching over everything. Um, so five years ago, Sansare walked through the door, big, strong, very impressive black woman. And, but she was crying. She couldn't even talk because she burst crying. She was homeless. She had six children whom she loved, and they loved her, but they couldn't help her. Quite hysterical. And the lady with me, the, my manager, sweetly said, Everyone in this house has known this abandonment and this sadness, but you will find a home here and you will be happy. So Sansari comes in and I get to know Sansari, very quiet, but to my surprise, she's actually very steady emotionally, very intelligent, strong, uh, street smart. And then about five months later when I needed a, a manager, she was the obvious choice. And she's, a ma she's there now, she's a magnificent, She's strong, she's a steady presence. She always lowers the temperature. You know, when people are angry and fighting or there's, there's mania or there's like high anxiety, she always lowers the temperature. And she has now, um, she told me when she was young, she always wanted to be a manager. So she has the dream of her life, you know. And she has now, she's ta we've taken in two granddaughters. One was pregnant, we took her in during the pregnancy. Two of her daughters are there. And Sansare is now um, in RCAA. She, she hopes to enter the Catholic Church in Easter, which of course thrills me. So that's a, that, I have so many happy stories. I could go on a long, long time, you know. But um, and just this week, another lady, uh, a dear friend of ours, a, 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 a resident volunteer who's become a dear friend of my family and my own, and she wanted to talk about a personal thing with her family. So we talked a few minutes, and then I didn't say much, but uh, she smiled at me and she said, well, thank you for your, the gift of your attention, she said. And then she quoted Simone Weil. She said, uh, Simone Weil says, attention is the most rare and pure 
expression of generosity. Beautiful quote, right? Attention is the most rare and pure form of generosity. And I thought to myself, that's just right, you know? If, if, attention is like the, it's the, it's like the gold, it's the magic. It's like, uh, this work for me is like Martha and Mary, where Martha is keeping the place going, you know? It, it's like uh, the plant maintenance and the, the, um, the paperwork, um, changing light bulbs and shoveling snow and getting people to doctors and going to the bank, all that Martha stuff. But Mary is the gem, you know? Mary is the real magic. Um, attention is probably, I think, the most underrated and desperately needed thing in the world. When you think about it, right? Attention. I'm glad to see you nodding. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you agree. Um, COVID hit us hard early in March. One of our smaller home with 15 people. We have about 50 women in the two homes in Jersey City. But the smaller home with 15 people, it hit us in March, and we had three deaths. And we had our staff was out. Our three staff members were out either sick or, or quarantining because of their medical conditions. And we were very anxious that it would spread. And uh, so uh, I was the only one that could go in there. I went in there, of course. And my family was uh, fighting with me insisting that I wear like the PPE and the shield and the garb. To be honest, I put on one day, I just couldn't do it. I just took a calculated risk. Public health protocols are not my strength. Um, no Tony Fauci. But when Florence came back, she's a nurse and she was very good. She was sanitizing and taking temperatures and you know, she was doing, we were doing the right stuff thanks to her. So we got through that with a lot of prayer. We got through that. And the other day, one of the ladies said to my wife, thank you for taking care of us through that. So when my wife told me, I, I thought to myself, well, what, what did we do? Well, what we really did was we showed up. We just showed up. Um, a young woman, a lovely young woman I know in her 30s said to her mother uh, recently, uh, she hopes to meet somebody, and she said, I just want a guy that'll show up. I just want a guy that'll show up. I think Woody Allen said, life is 99% showing up. So after attention, I think showing up may be the second most underrated and desperately needed. So I'm going to end with that. I thank you, Marriage and Canada, Rebecca. I thank you who are um, showing up and giving me your precious and rare gift of attention. Thank you. I, that, that's definitely a, a great note for all of us, I think. Um, we now want to hear from another home, um, Father Justin Fedden and Gabriel Tunich Cooper. Um, they're remote guests of ours. Uh, Father Dustin is a priest in the Diocese of Pensacola, Tall Tallahassee, and he teaches philosophy at St. John Vianney College Seminary in their online program. He joins us today to tell us about the Joseph House, which he founded in May of 2019. After spending two years visiting with incarcerated men, often those in solitary confinement, Father Dustin was inspired to start a nonprofit ministry, which he called Joseph House. Father Justin Sorry, Father Dustin is the executive director of Joseph House, which was designed to support the complete restoration and full integration of formerly incarcerated individuals, above all, those incarcerated for violent crimes into local communities and neighborhoods. So this is a really impressive and, and beautiful ministry. Um, he is joined uh, by Gabriel Tunich Cooper. Gabriel, originally from Miami, <laughs> is a resident at Joseph House. Gabriel is currently pursuing his GED while also building rocking horses for Joseph House Enterprises. We are honored to have Father Dustin and Gabriel share their experience of life in Joseph House in 2020. Thank you. All right, yeah. Thank you, Rebecca, uh, for inviting us to be able to share a little bit about Joseph House. It's gonna be difficult to find uh, some, some quotable you know, quotes <laughs> like uh, Woody Allen and Simone Vey, right? I love that, uh, bringing Woody and Simone into conversation. Uh, but yeah, so uh, just a, a very brief word about, about Joseph House. Uh, it's, it, we, we're in Tallahassee, Florida, and in, in kind of the Midtown City Center area here. And uh, as you had mentioned, Rebecca, it was started in, in large part, you know, after doing so many different cell front visits in uh, particularly in solitary confinement. 
in seeing just these brutal, horrific conditions that um, that men were living in, men and women. But in, in any given moment, we in the state of Florida, we have about 10,000 men in in solitary confinement. And, you know, the, the best way, the best description of describing what solitary confinement like, it's like living in a mop closet uh, and with constant noise and banging uh, and then obviously isolation and you know, looking and, and, and having conversations with these men uh, through a plexiglass window uh, and hearing about their lives and, and where they grew up. And then also realizing that many of them uh, had no idea where they were going when they got out. In fact, many men that I would talk with uh, would leave directly from solitary confinement to the bus stations. They would just be released from these dungeons, essentially. And uh, it, it dawned on me that we, uh, as a church, have to do something if we're going to be preaching the gospel uh, in this area. If we're, you know, if we have knowledge of the situation that these men are in and that they have nowhere to go when they leave, uh, you know, we we should be uh, the people of hospitality, of, of welcoming the strangers, of welcoming the exiles back into the land. And so. Uh, you know, after a while, it, you know, myself and a few others started, a few parishioners started really dreaming big about creating a, a community, welcoming these guys back. And and I just have to say, uh, this may not quite compare to Woody Allen and Simone <laughs> Vey, but while I was doing these cell front visits, it was uh, the work of Brian Stevenson that was a great inspiration for me, uh, especially his his call to uh, to proximity. Uh, that the best way to fight injustices is to draw close to the marginalized. Uh, and then obviously as well, Pope Francis uh, talking about building a field hospital uh, where there is bleeding uh, and, 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 and his call to this kind of accompaniment, what it means to walk with people. Uh, and after a while, uh, it, it seemed almost impossible, frankly, to, to pitch the idea uh, to our uh, to bishop and to others that you know let's build a home uh, and welcome uh, men that are coming out of prison out of Florida's prisons. Uh, but this was if, I remember right around the time when it was in, during Advent and the preface you may may know uh, there's the, the phrase dare to hope. And that phrase just kept speaking to me every time I would celebrate mass during Advent dare to hope. Uh, and it was almost as though, you know, that the Lord was inviting some of us, myself and some lay people, to really risk uh, creating something, uh, creating a house, creating a community uh, where men could be welcomed back into our communities. And so we did. And, and we did. And I, I really appreciate what Carolina said. You know, uh, the people that essentially created this community are people all over the ideological spectrum, uh, people you know, on the, the right and on the left, you know, uh, people that probably often would not really share meals together or talk about culture and, and politics together. But so many people from all over the spectrum rallied around to create a, a beautiful house uh, in a very safe place uh, to serve those that are um, in need of a, of a house. And, you know, for us, we really invested a lot in community. Our, our greatest capital at Joseph House are parishioners, our lay people, our, you know, older parishioners, younger parishioners, and also people that are, you know, just live in the community here. And we really started off in 2019 kind of with a bang. We had a lot of people coming out and, you know, taking guys to get driver's license, helping them, you know, shop at the grocery store and uh, prepare for their GED. But then COVID hit, of course, uh, the pandemic hit. And I remember it just kind of came to a screeching halt and thinking, where are our people, you know, where, how is this gonna survive? And, and without the volunteers, without community members coming in, interacting with the guys that are staying here at Joseph House. And I remember one day pulling up to uh, Joseph House and we had this, our, our backyard, while our, the interior is beautiful, the backyard was like an, a, infested with weeds and like a, a mini jungle out there. And I remember pulling up into the driveway and just thinking, this has got to end. 
Uh, so, you know, maybe we can start planting. And I talked to Gabriel about it. Uh, and then I talked to a few of our other uh, community members about creating a, a meditation garden uh, and, and to start planting. Uh, and so I think literally that day, Gabriel and I went out and just started hacking weeds uh, and, you know, knees and, and elbows in the soil. And it was there that I got to know Gabriel. And it was in those long conversations in the, the heat and the humid heat of, of, you know, the Panhandle, Florida in summer that I got to know Gabriel conversations uh, and getting to know more about his history, him getting to know a little bit more about me, us going to the nursery together to pick up plants and all of that. And it was the sense of, you know, relationship is the only way forward. <laughs> For us, uh, it, it's to me, and this is kind of bringing back again, you know, Brian Stevenson's kind of call to gaining proximity, closer proximity to discover each other uh, and in doing so, discovering shared projects. And for me, that is kind of fundamental to what Joseph House is. So at this point, I'm going to kind of pass the mic uh, over here to, uh, to my brother, Gabriel. Okay, hello. how you guys doing? Uh, I'm going to just first start off with a prayer. Uh, dear graceful God, we thank you for this uh, season of, of Valentine's. And we want to pray for all the single people, the widow people, people who don't have a home. Let them know that not just today, not just today, we we should not just today that it's a loving day we should love continually show kind words and just show just have for love and uh i start with my speech my speech is greeting my virtual family friends just want to say it's a big blessing to share what god has done for me at the joseph house when i was released out of prison it was a struggle thinking about a stable place to rest that was heavy on my mind. That day, I went to the sheriff's office for fingerprinting, and I met one of the interns from Joseph House. That moment, I knew God still cared about me, and I want to see and wants to see me doing good. This all happened before COVID nineteen. I got acquainted with the Joseph House community. I became a part of the building. I became a part of building the meditation garden there. I spent two months working, chopping branches and laying soil down and planting flowers. Okay, um, yeah, it was just, um, before I get into the activities I do at the Joseph House, uh, we believe in um, Joseph who dreams and continues his dreams. And I recently just got a tattoo of Joseph, I, I recently got a tattoo of Joseph. Amazing. And it and I it's in Hebrew it says Joseph dreams a dream. So uh, I know this as a as a male figure. We're in the pandemic. We're in the COVID and pandemic and everything. And I know that I mark my body, and this is something I have to deal with. They're going to be. Uh, uh, bad thoughts about it when I have rocky days, but mm. this community has overwhelmed me with so much love and I feel that when I look at that tattoo or when if I'm just speaking and existing that I have to dream and this community is big on sleeping, having a house over your head, making sure that you're comfortable and your mental health is safe. So I think that I made the right decision with this tattoo. And when I leave, I accomplish and achieve many goals. And um, one of the activities I'm involved, involved in is book club virtual. We're doing Just Mercy. Uh, you guys can you guys can join. You guys can join, please. We we're, we're need some suggestions on a new book. Uh, we get together once a week and read Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. I'm a big fan. 
haven't met him yet, but I'm a big fan. <laughs> uh, we take turns reading, breaking down words when um, quick, convo, quick, quick quote. Uh, I did not know how to read. I didn't take school serious. But once I ended up to the Joseph house, these people had helped me capitalize big, big words. And I know how to read fluency. And I'm starting school Tuesday. I have my placement test. Uh, we discuss our feelings and reactions. And um, thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Um, this is a, a really humbling event <laughs> this evening. Um, yeah, um, Dr. Uh, now, without further ado, I'll <laughs> bring, give the mic to Dr. Juan Tapia Mendoza. He's joining us on stage, as you can see. Um, he was born in the Dominican Republic and grew up in the Washington Heights neighborhood of New York, where he joined a gang and became a famous graffiti artist under the pseudonym Cat87. Because he hadn't attended school regularly, he was almost illiterate but he still dreamed of being a doctor. I'm looking at you, Gabriel. <laughs> As it happened, although he had no academic history, his graffiti art showed that he was a highly motivated young man, and he was given the opportunity of attending college, the Universidad Central del Este in Santo Domingo. His dream became a reality, and today, Dr. Juan is one of the most respected pediatricians in New York. He founded Pediatrics 2000, a clinic where he helps children from the Hispanic community. He is also a proud member of SOMOS, a network of doctors serving the most vulnerable people in New York. Now we will hear how he and his doctor friends in SOMOS did not lose hope despite the many challenges and hardships of this past year. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your invitation. Yes, I was born in the Dominican Republic and my mother, like many other immigrants, uh, she came in the early 60s and left me in the Dominican Republic to live with my, uh, with my extended family. And uh, she brought me back to the United States but for the first time. Can you speak into the mic? I think it's a little hard to hear. I forgot I had a mic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, I, I was left in the Dominican Republic, and my mother came to New York in 1960. For the next four years, I lived in... I didn't even realize that my mother w was gone because I lived with a, lot, with a lot of extended family in a in a poor community in the capital of the Dominican Republic where everybody knew each other, every, everybody cared for each other. It was a real community where to be called Negrito um, meant to be called Mi Amor. And suddenly I came to the United States in, in the summer of, of 1966 and I was shocked because my first words when I arrived at, at, uh, at 187th Street and Broadway and St. Nicholas was that my building looked like the ruins of uh, Columbus. And I came from a poor neighborhood in the, in the Dominican Republic. And my second uh, setback was that I was going to the sixth grade in the Dominican Republic. But due to my age, I was demoted to the fourth grade. And that quickly led to me losing interest in school. But I was not the only one that lost interest because at that time there was a social promotion, which meant that in school you didn't have to know anything. What was important in the types of neighborhoods that, what, that I grew up in uh, that is similar to any other uh, neighborhood where you, where you have a lot of minorities, a lot of immigrants, of poor health literacy, uh, people of color, and Latinos, where social promotion existed so as as you had social promotion, but also you also had social demotion. I was demoted to the fourth grade, and by my first two years in, the, in, in New York, I had already lost interest in school, and I turned to the streets, where I felt welcome, where 80% of, uh, of my neighbors were also drop, drop out. So I started playing hooky. I don't know if, that's still, if we still use that word, I started not going to school after the sixth grade. And for the next four years, I was promoted over and over from seventh grade to eighth grade, ninth grade, all the way up to high school without ever returning back to school. And until I was eventually kicked out of George Washington, George Washington High School for doing graffiti. I was lucky to find 
First, I never lost hope because one of the things that my mother taught me was that at the worst of times, there's always hope and that always bad things are followed by good things. And that at the end, uh, goodness triumphs over, over evil. And I have always practiced that. As many times as I, as I went through hardships, I always remember what my mother told me. Juan, if you, if you fall down, stand up. Uh, I did many things that I shouldn't have done while I was a graffiti artist. I was a, a gang member. I was the warlord. Uh, the warlord of, of a gang meant like the secretary of state, but in a gang, a warlord was the person that can go from one neighborhood uh, gang to another without getting beat up. Because I used to be like uh, the person that would set up uh, the, the fighting, uh, peacemaking deals. And in fact, most of the fighting we just ran away because all the other gang members were really uh, big guys, older than us, like the Galaxies and the Saints from, from West Harlem. We were in Washington Heights. And I was lucky to find a mentor, which I think is also so important in life. When you have a mentor that listens, that listens to you and that understands your problem. And I was lucky enough to find somebody um, by the name of Hugo Martinez that said that these graffiti artists, the original graffiti artists from the early 70s were not vandals. These were kids that were highly motivated, just like myself, because I felt, I felt isolated. I felt discriminated. I felt that I had no reason to leave. And what gave me a feeling of belonging to my community was the fact that I became a famous graffiti artist. And I think that all of us not only need to have a hero, but we need to have somebody that listens to us, to, to, to worry about us. And that I found with Hugo Martinez, I, I was one of the lucky ones that, uh, that did not wind up in jail because between the ages of nine and I would say 13, I saw a change in all of my friends because none of my friends ever said that they wanted to be, you know, a thief or, or a drug dealer or a pimp. All my friends used to talk about being lawyers, you know, doctors, accountants. We, we had a lot of movie stars. <laughs> Most of my friends thought that somehow they were gonna go to Hollywood. But by age 13 or 15, I had, you know, I have over 10 friends of mine that were killed, that were locked up, that were overdosed. Uh, most of them dropped out. Uh, right now, I have maybe two or three friends from being, after living in the United States for, for more than 50 years because society absorbed most of my, most of my friends. So I decided to come, become a doctor. I didn't want to do pediatrics, but never say never. I became a, a pediatrician and I decided to stay in my community because uh, communities like ours, where, where my people live, we have a bad reputation that everything sucks and that we are inherently bad, that uh, everything that happens to us is our fault and that there is nothing you can do about it but accept your, your, your destiny. My mother, uh, showed me that that's not true, my faith, and my, uh, not only my faith, but I never lost hope, even in the worst of times. And when I met Somos, which is a, a, a community of uh, physicians, of primary care physicians of over 2,500 that are in New York, uh, this brainchild uh, named Dr. Ramon Talash had the idea of uniting the the community physicians, not only so that they can fight uh, for their part of the share of the healthcare dollar, but also that they can fight for, uh, for the invisible communities. The communities that have been traditionally underserved, underrepresented, uh, that are fearful of hospitals, that have nobody to turn to, that do not speak the language, do not understand the system, I have no sophistication uh, at hospitals. When I started practicing 25 years ago, 
hospitals used to turn away our patients that did not have Medicaid. So I followed a lead of, a lead of other doctors that decided to stay in communities like ours uh, to work uh, specifically with Medicaid patients. And over the last 20 years, uh, this small group of doctors has turned into SOMOS, which is a network of over 2,500 doctors dedicated to caring for the most needed. And uh, when the pandemic came, this, this is, that's when it came to light, all the disparities that communities like ours have been suffering for centuries. And Dr. Talash, along with, with the governor and other people that are good people, decided that we, had, that we could not wait for the federal government to start uh, doing something because it was complete chaos. We didn't have no personal protection equipment. We had, we had an agency that was uh, dedicated to planning for catastrophes, either biological warfare or, or new pathogens, like in this case, the coronavirus. We, unlike uh, other, other nations, did not have agencies that were prepared. So uh, I saw that in America, it was every man for themselves. And Dr. Talash, along with Somos, we started doing testing because the primary thing you have to do in a pandemic is test to find out where the disease is spreading, contact uh, tracing, and isolation of, of uh, people that are sick and, and people that could be sick. For, for 14 days. And Dr. Talash and Somos have been doing that for the, past, uh, for the past year. And this year, I see a lot of hope for 2021 because now we have the vaccine of hope. I know a lot of people, especially our Latino people and, and uh, Afro-Americans are fearful of the system because of, the, of so many things that have happened uh, throughout generations. And I tell everybody that I already got vaccinated. We need to be vaccinated. We need to believe in science. And I really see a, a light at the end of the future. And I'm, my message for this year is let's not lose hope. And if we fall down, always stand back up. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Wow. Um, I'm gonna conclude with a quote from Father Giussani. Um, Father Giussani once said that reality, as it emerges in experience, is so positive that it presents itself as inexorably appealing. Instead of appealing, we might use another word, promising. Um, and I want to thank our friends tonight, you know, Matt, Gabriel, Dustin, Carolina, wherever you are, Juan. <laughs> um, because you and your communities really have given flesh to this ultimate irreducible positivity of life. Um, and in a, in a few moments, uh, Father Caron will join us with some conclude, concluding remarks. But before we turn to him, we have one last virtual guests, um, guest, uh, the Spanish uh, Basque sociologi sociologist, excuse me, Mikel Azurmendi is gonna speak to us about where he still manages to find hope in the midst of his pessimism. Mikel. Eh, en este panorama, en, eh, que como dices tú, la, las posibilidades van desde el individualismo más feroz hasta, hasta el reconocer que, que, el, que, que el otro puede ser un bien. Tú has escrito recientemente un libro, eh, El otro es un bien. Eh, ¿De dónde puede surgir un cambio en esta dirección? ¿Qué, qué, qué espera el, 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 el ser humano? ¿Qué esperas tú? Eh, como posibilidad de, de, de cambio fuerte de la humanidad, de la propia. Vamos a ver, eh, un niño de, siete, de cinco a siete años, eh, de los 50 millones de niños que están trabajando en el mundo, trabajando jornadas agotadoras, eh, ¿qué espera ese niño? O sea, hay que plantearse así, ¿qué espera ese niño? Hombre, ¿qué puede esperar? Que alguien le saque de ese infierno, por supuesto, pero, pero esa espera... ¿Cómo se concreta? Solo esa espera depende de que alguien le quiera, de que alguien le redima. Solo el amor le puede darle, sacarle de, de esa espera de ese niño. Por ejemplo, eh, un joven africano, una joven, eh, que su, su familia 
ha recogido una cantidad de dinero para pagar a una mafia de pateras y se lo envía hacia Europa. ¿Qué quiere ese niño, ese, ese joven, esa joven? Solo quiere papeles. O sea, nosotros no se los damos, pero solo pide papeles. O pide a alguna persona que le acompañe, que le quiera, que le entienda y que le introduzca en esta sociedad que no entiende. Es decir, yo, por ejemplo, yo, ¿no? Una persona mayor como yo, ¿yo qué quiero? La eutanasia, o sea, esa cosa legal. O yo quiero que alguien me quiera y me alivie el dolor cuando venga. ¿Veis? Yo podría decirte eso que esperamos, ¿no? Y seguir sector por sector social y tardaríamos un mes hablando de lo que todo el mundo debe esperar, ¿no? Yo creo que todos esperamos que se nos quiera, solo el amor da esperanza y el amor en la política, en la política, ¿eh? en esto del Capitolio, en esto, solo se llama búsqueda del consenso. O sea que no hay más, no, no veo nada más, no soy muy optimista. ¿ves? Pero hay salida, ¿eh? hay salida. El amor... Good evening. We want to spend and share these last few minutes of the 2021 encounter with Father Julian Caron, president of the Fraternity of Communion and Liberation. He is not in New York this year, but one way or another, he's always with us. So thank you, Father Caron, for being with us. And to him, we want to ask the question that has accompanied us throughout the weekend. Father Caron, the year we just went by 
has brought about a big change. How the experience of change has become a milestone in our life journey. Yo pienso que todos nosotros hemos percibido en esta, este año un desafío sin proporciones respecto a la normalidad del vivir. Todos hemos estado desafiados por la enfermedad, por la muerte de personas cercanas, por el problema del trabajo, por el problema de las preguntas que surgían constantemente en nosotros delante de todos estos hechos que provocaban constantemente nuestra humanidad a salir a flote, como si hubiéramos descubierto parte de la profundidad de nuestro yo, que no se podía contentar simplemente con, que, con el, lo ya sabido, con lo que ya cada uno tiene en la cabeza, sino que requería eh, respuestas a preguntas que en tantas ocasiones en la vida normal no las concedemos ningún espacio. Ahora urgen. Y entonces, la primera cuestión, para que esto pueda ser una, un punto de no retorno, algo que se adquiere significativamente, es que uno se dé cuenta de qué es lo que ha sucedido. No basta que suceda para que uno lo conserve como algo, como un tesoro que ha adquirido para afrontar su futuro. Hace falta que sea verdaderamente juzgado con, en su valor, darme cuenta de algo, y esto lo vemos en la, en la modalidad con la que eh, podemos volver después a las cosas normales. Si verdaderamente hemos aprendido algo, lo veremos en la novedad con la que hacemos gestos que hacíamos antes, casi normales, eh, descontados y que ahora empezamos a darnos cuenta que una, presente, que una persona esté presente y que la podamos abrazar y que nos demos cuenta de su valor no es lo mismo que como lo vivíamos antes casi dándolo por supuesto. Esto es un ejemplo de tantas cosas como el tener trabajo, como el volver a trabajar, como el despertarse por la mañana y no tener que estar encerrado como el perder, el volver a sentir y a experimentar dentro de sí la urgencia del vivir, todo esto será significativo si nosotros hemos crecido como personas y, por tanto, hemos hecho experiencia, porque solo hemos hecho experiencia que sea significativa si hemos crecido como personas, es decir, tenemos una conciencia más clara de para qué tenemos la vida y cuál es su significado si algo de, de esto ha aparecido en el horizonte en este año. Y esto será lo que nos permita afrontar los nuevos desafíos con un yo crecido, con un, un yo que ha madurado y no simplemente se ha empequeñecido por la, el miedo o por la... Eh, la falta de, de confianza respecto al futuro. A mí me parece que si nosotros nos damos cuenta verdaderamente de lo que hemos podido crecer y aprender, será esto lo que reste como significativo para afrontar los desafíos del futuro. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you, Father Caron. Thank you, all of you who have been part of the 2021 encounter, and thank you to all those who made it happen, all volunteers, as always, uh, volunteers in this adventure of gratuitousness and gratitude. I, it wasn't easy, uh, but we knew we needed it, and we're grateful we made it. So let's keep all that we received uh, in our heart so that it may bear fruit and continue to build a new world within this world. Thank you, Father Caron, again. And now back to John and the Shin Center. Goodbye. And good night from the Shin Center, and we will see you at Encounter 2021.
2022.